Welcome back to our lecture series, Linear Algebra Done Openly. As usual, I'll be your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. In section 4.5, we're going to talk about orthogonal projections. Now, what does that mean? I mean? We've talked about the idea of a projection, right? Uh, a projection, these linear transformations, so when you compose them together, the second time doesn't do anything new. It's as if you have some type of vector space right? And then a vector living in said vector space, maybe not inside the field, or the, not inside the, the plane or subspace, I should say, in which case then we can project that the shadow of that vector into the space. Well, orthogonal, as we've learned, means something to do with right angles. And so the orthogonal projection will be a projection of a vector into a space so that a right angle is formed between uh, the the between the projection and the normal vector of the space. That, that's going to be our goal here. So before we get into that, let me first talk about uh, the so-called Parseval's identity. So we have a set of vectors, S, which contains P many vectors, V1, V2, up to Vp, living inside of our vector space, Fn. And let's claim that this is an orthogonal set. So uh, the pair, given any pair of vectors inside of S, their dot product or Hermitian product will equal zero. So we say that a vector y, well, we so we know that, um, let's say that y is a linear combination of the vectors from s. So there are coefficients c1, c2, up to cp. So y equals c1, v1, plus c2, v2, plus c3, v3, all the way up to cp, uh, cp, vp. So in other words, y is contained inside the span of this set of vectors s right here. And so that's our w our subspace W in consideration right here. So what Parseval's identity says is that because, because the spanning set here is orthogonal, we can actually compute the coefficients using dot products, our Hermitian products. We can use the inner product and compute this. The coefficients are gonna look like vi dot y over vi dot vi. And these are commonly referred to as the Fourier coefficients of this combination. Now, I wanted to kind of mention this in contrast. That in, in the past, when we wanted to decide is a vector y inside the span of a set of vectors, we would have to set up basically a linear system of equations where the columns in the coefficient matrix will be the vectors from the set S, and then we would augment it with y, and then we have to row reduce it, right, until you get the identity or something close to the identity. You get some echelon form right there. And then you get your answer, you know, in this final column. We usually have to row reduce these things in order to, in order to get the coefficients. Which row reduction, although it's a nice algorithm, it is a fast algorithm. It is, you know, it, it's not the simplest algorithm, right? There could be simpler procedures. And it turns out when, you're, when your spanning set is orthogonal, you actually get a very simpler calculation. We don't have to solve any linear systems. We can actually compute the coefficients from the inner product. And so why does this work? So the idea is let's take this linear combination right here. If we take y is equal to c1 v1 plus c2 v2 all the way down to cp vp. And let's be careful. We pay attention to who's a vector and who's a scalar. So what I want to do is I'm going to take the inner product of vi on both sides. So take the inner product vi dot y on the left vi dot, well, this linear combination on the right. Well, the inner product, it, like other multiplications, will distribute over vector addition. We can also pull out scalars from the right factor. So this would look like vi dot y, and we're going to end up with vi dot c1 v1 all the way down to vi dot cp. VP. Now, when you're working with these inner products here, we have to be very careful when you work with complex matrices because of the conjugate transpose that comes into play here. We do have to take conjugates of scalars at times, so you have to be very careful. So when I wrote this formula for Parseval's identity, the Fourier coefficients, I should say, notice I put the vector in question on the right. That is necessary if you want this formula to work for complex vectors. Uh, with real vectors, we can be a little bit more careless. Because with complex, with the Hermitian product, right, we have the property that scalars can come out of the right factor. If we pull them out of the left factor, it does require we take conjugates. So the left-hand side is vi dot y. The right-hand side, we're going to get c1 times vi 
dot v1. And then the next one will look like c2 times vi dot v2. All the way down till the end, we'd end up with cp times vi dot vp. And so this is where the assumption of orthogonality comes into play. Look, we have all these dot products, all these Hermitian products uh, between the vectors from S. And so these should all be zero with one important exception. These are all going to turn out to be zero with the exception of the I position. CI is going to look like VI dot VI. Since it's an inner product, the inner product of a vector with itself is never going to equal zero. And so then we get VI dot Y. Divide both sides. Divide both sides by vi dot vi. Like I said, that's never going to equal zero because we have an inner product. The positive definite condition forbids such a thing. And so then you solve for c and you get the formula that we had just right here. So vi dot y over vi dot vi. So that's the argument that justifies uh, Parseval's identity. Uh, let's see it in practice. Consider the following set. V1, V2, V3. V1 is 1, 2, 3. V2 is 1, 1, negative 1. And V3 is negative 5, 4, negative 1. You can very quickly see that this is an orthogonal set of vectors. Notice, if you take v, uh, V1 dot V2, you're going to end up with 1 plus 2 minus 3. That's a 0. If you take V1 dot V3, that equals negative 5 plus 8 minus 3, which is 0. And lastly, V2 dot V3 is equal to negative five plus four plus one, which is equal to zero. This is an orthogonal set. And so in fact, if we call S the orthogonal set, uh, since it's orthogonal, it's gonna be linearly independent, right? Every linear, every, every orthogonal set is linearly independent. And then furthermore, since these are, these are vectors that live inside of R3, we have an independent set inside side of R3. This is actually uh, a basis. Uh, one could call this an orthogonal basis. Orthogonal basis for R3. Okay, so why is that important? Well, let's consider the vector y right here, negative 4, 8, and 10. Well, since this is a vector in R3, and since our basis, the set S is a basis for R3, we know that y can be spanned by the vectors in S. Okay, there's some linear combination of v1, v2, v3, that will produce this vector y right here. What are the coefficients? Well, we could do this. We could calculate this by looking at the matrix. 1, 2, 3, 1, 1, negative 1, negative 5, 4, negative 1, augment negative 4, 8, and 10. We could solve this system of equations, right? Get the identity, and you get, well, you'd get the coordinate vector of y with respect to s coordinates. This, this is what we could do. That's sort of the old way of doing it. What I want to argue now is that I can actually compute this using the inner product, okay? That is Fourier's coefficients. So what would that look like? So we're supposed to take the inner product of v1 dot y divided by v1 dot v1 and times that by v1. So if we actually see what that looks like, we're going to take, oh, you can't see it. If you take v1 dot y, I'm also going to scooch this over here to the side so we have some space. So if you take the dot product between v1 and y, you end up with negative 4. 2 times 8 is 16 plus 30. So then if you take 16 minus 4, that's equal to 12, plus 30 is 42. And if you take 1 plus 4 plus 9, that's equal to 14, like so. And 14 goes into 42 three times, right? 3 times 14 is 42. So then we would repeat this for the other one. So we're going to take v2 dot y. So that's going to look like negative 4 plus 8 minus 10 above v2 dot v2, which will look like 1 plus 1 plus 1 times that by v2. And so again, simplifying this, negative 4 plus 8 is 4 minus 10 is a negative 6. 1 plus 1 plus 1 is a 3. And negative 6 divided by 3 is a negative 2. And then finally, if we take v3 dot y, uh, you're going to end up with 20 plus 32 plus or minus 10 right there. And then that'll sit up the top of 25 plus 16 plus 1. And so simplifying that. And so taking 20 plus 32, uh, that's of course going to be 52 minus 10 is going to be 42. And that sits above 25 plus 16 plus 1, which also equals 
42, which case then it simplifies just to be one. Great. So then from there, we'll actually plug in the definitions of V1, V2, V3. So now we're gonna plug in V1, V2, V3 into the formula right here. So we're gonna take three times V1 times negative two times V2 times uh, plus one times V3. So looking there, you're gonna get three minus two minus five, that's a negative four. You take three times two minus two plus four, that's an eight. And then lastly, you get nine plus two minus one, which is gonna give us 10. But you'll notice this was the original vector y that we were starting off with. So this is in fact the legit uh, linear combination. So this in fact gives us the coordinate vector of y with respect to the s coordinates here. It's simply gonna be three, negative two, and one. And so we were able to find this out without using any uh, systems of equations. We did this entirely with the inner product here. It's a lot slicker, it's really nice, but we were only able to do that because we had this orthogonal spanning set.